What's up everyone? And I'm coming to you live from under the dash of the Bel Air today. And uh, today we are doing something cosmetic, uh, but something that I've wanted to do for a while and finally had the opportunity to work on. This thing has bothered me for a while now. That's the blanking plate where if you don't have an Impala, then uh, you'd normally have a clock there. But uh, in a Bel Air or a Biscayne, unless they optioned it up, you get this you know, snazzy little blanking plate that does nothing. And honestly, that kind of sucks when you have this super cool gauge cluster that is based around a five pod setup, and then one of the pods is literally a dummy gauge. So I was thinking, oh, I'll just jump on and scoop up one of these clocks. Why not? Just, you know, scoop one up, stick it in there, no big deal. And then I saw what they cost. I should have known that a somewhat desirable option only from a higher spec vehicle would have been a harder part to come across and fetch a decent price, but hey, uh, it looks like they run about 275 bucks for one that's been gone through, guaranteed to work, all that stuff. But even a non-working one fetches 170 bucks, something like that. I mean, I've been seeing a lot of prices that are well over $100 for one that is untested, which in my mind means they probably did test it and it's not working. But, like it does so often, patience paid off. So after searching around for quite a while, I got this guy. Said it was made in July of 59, and uh, the seller, uh, you know, same as what I was mentioning before, said it's untested, i.e. they hadn't plugged this in to see if it works under power. Uh, again, I'm presuming this does not work, but I did um, see one thing in the article that piqued my interest, which is when you turn this dial, the needles actually move, which means that at least the mechanism inside does work. Whether the quartz movement does, who knows. Whee! So originally I was hunting on eBay and the regular sites for these parts, and uh, that's where I was seeing all the high prices. I ended up actually finding this listed on, uh, I think it's oldride.com. I was searching in a broader sense and came across the seller there. So it's worth expanding your search if you're not finding what you're looking for. Uh, this gentleman's parting out a few of these cars, and um, you know, forums would be another good place to go as well, but I found the sale that way. And it looks like it's aged just about the same as my other gauges, so it'll fit right in. Anyway, so I paid right about 60 bucks for the thing, and uh, I think that's a, a worthwhile investment to fix a problem that's been bothering me. And honestly, even if the clock doesn't work, I think it'll be simple enough to adapt a more modern clock internal into it at some point. So uh, if it doesn't fire up, I'm just going to leave it in there and it'll still look better anyway, and I can always come back and make it work later. Now onto the how-to portion. Step one, you want to remove the pod. You're gonna remove the Phillips screws from here and here. And that brings me back to why I was under the dash. There is now a 7 16th or 11 mil nut uh, at the very top of the gauge pod, basically right around here that you need to remove on the inside of the dash. Uh, it's gonna to be tough to show you with my phone, so uh, just fish around, you'll find it. It's basically in between the two gauges right around there. That one. While you're under there, you also need to loosen the same size nut at the top rear of the speedo assembly as well, which I conveniently just did up after rebuilding my speedometer, and I did a lovely job of making it super nice and tight, but I now have that loosened, and uh, underneath the speedo, you've got these two screws on either side, and basically, um, once you've loosened those, you get a little wiggle room in this, and now this pod can come out. I mentioned this in my other video, uh, just being cautious when removing these plugs. Um, so I just kind of very gently pry with a flat blade here, and I'm being serious when I say gently, I'm just teasing it off little by little off of these plugs here. Um, I've tried pulling by hand a couple times and found that you know you risk maybe pulling a wire out of the back of one or something like that. So usually I found that if you can just get stable purchase with a screwdriver, and just gently kind of work them off. That seems to be a little more friendly and forgiving. And then the same with the bulb assemblies here. Um, if you can kind of get them started, uh, the risk is when they pop. Oh, well, actually that one came out okay. But you see how that snapped out. Uh, if you hit the bulb on the side of the assembly, you do risk breaking the glass inside the gauge. Um, so if you get it started, you could always get a flat blade behind it and just pop it more straight back. But there she is. And there's the dummy plate. Looks as though we just have to remove this one screw, and that's what's pinning the thing in place, and then these keys here are what's stopping it from rotating. So, I'm going to disconnect this and see if we can't pop this thing out. There it is. And now we put this guy in place. 
go. And I immediately noticed something, which is this does not have any specific screw hold downs. So it looks like from the factory, I'm guessing you had a different shaped bracket that probably pinned this down. And that's what held this in place. It uses the same keyways, so it doesn't rotate. And the face does look really good in there. But I do not have this bracket. So I'm gonna need to probably make something that pins this down there properly. Now, while I'm farting around figuring out how to mount this in place, I should also note the backlighting situation. In my car, I've actually replaced the stereo with an aftermarket one, which has left me with two uh, unused bulb leads that were originally used to backlight the factory head unit. Um, initially, I actually trimmed the bulb holders off, and I just heat shrinked the um, the cable so that it didn't short out on the, uh, the dash. I do still have the bulb holders, so for me, I'm gonna take this gray wire that is conveniently situated right here, I'm gonna solder the bulb holder back on and that will work for my application. Now, if you still have your factory stereo in place and it still uses those two bulbs, you may need to create your own wire and get your own bulb holder. I do remember, I think, seeing these on Rock Auto or something like that. I do believe these are readily available. And I also have about a million spare bulbs. Now off to the workshop to see if we can figure out how to mount this uh, clock in place. It appears that science wins again. Okay, so I may be speaking too soon, but I did some very preliminary measuring. And I had this concept of what if I just put a bend right here on the far side of the uh, original mounting hole, so that it basically now makes a sharp 90 straight up, and then we conveniently already have this 90 here, which looks to be the right depth. Let me actually show you, sorry. And uh, I did the measurement of basically the um, the distance from here to here, and it's pretty darn close. I think, I wouldn't be surprised if from the factory they just made this one bracket, and the cars that got a clock, they just bent this piece 90 degrees that way, and uh, yeah, they used the same thing. So I'm gonna basically just put this in my bench vise and go, yeah, and see if that does it. My workshop is a huge mess. All right, we're gonna clamp these bad boys on here. And I have this lined up right here as a pivot point. I'm gonna go slowly and steadily just to see, uh, and I wanna make sure I'm not accidentally bending it along the lines of the vice grip, but just along the lines of the, uh, the bench vice. So I'm gonna start going with that. If it starts to make sense, we're gonna make the bend. That does seem to be bending along the axis that I want it to, so we're gonna go for it. I am like the mighty Thor. So what I ended up doing, once I got it started, I basically got it uh, bent back and then I put the vice grips on this piece just to provide a little bit of pressure and tension pulling back. And then I actually was tapping with my hammer here to make sure that it was bending along the point that I wanted it to. And that seems to have provided a pretty good 90. My masterpiece is complete. It's a little bendy, but it'll do the job. I still bet I'm right though. I bet you they use this same bracket and just put extra bends in it at the factory and that way it would fit the clock. So I'm putting the screw back in now. I'm gonna pin these back in place. I'd say that actually went pretty well considering I basically just eyeballed that. And I have a clock now. And look, it doesn't even fly out or anything. Now the other thing I failed to mention is that this thing probably needs a 12 volt constant, I would guess, just to keep time. So I'm going to figure out uh, where I want to pull that 12 volt constant from. I'll figure out what circuit makes sense and then I'll let you guys know what I end up doing. The nice thing is it's just teeing into that and adding a spade connector. All right, I soldered the, uh, the bulb fixture back on here so we are good to go as far as illumination at least. Now I think I'm actually going to reinstall this assembly and then I'll work on hooking up the power for the clock momentarily. She is back in and man does that look good. So I did test the backlight real quick just to make sure that the bulb lit up um, and basically uh, we're all successful there. We have a good backlight for the clock. Um, so now we're on to checking where I want to pull that 12 volt constant from. It's nice when you have the factory assembly manual to reference uh, which shows how the whole car was put together including the full wiring diagram. So this is the wiring diagram for pretty much the entire vehicle. However, they have a sub page that relates to the, uh, the gauge panel. And if you ever needed to reference this, go ahead and pause now. Hopefully the camera's focused enough for you to be able to see it. But this was the one that caught my interest. And basically, um, I tracked down the 
clock right here. And this was the main power source and I followed it blah, 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 through all of this and basically discovered that um, it's fed right from this uh, red wire that's on the light switch connector. And I did verify that this is the same shape as the, uh, the plug that attaches to the backside of my, my pull switch for the lights. Um, so I started looking into this idea of teeing off of the red um, power feed that goes into that. Um, but then I had a kind of better idea rather than having to kind of splice into something. I'm a firm believer whenever possible in not hacking up your original wiring. Um, you know, my first car, I used all the tap connectors and things like that. And um, it was kind of a hack job, honestly. But subsequent vehicles, I've always been careful to either make my own wiring or, you know, try to do, uh, you know, non-permanent adjustments to the wiring. And I'll show you what I mean here in a sec. So this is our fuse panel. And as you can see, we have the old style glass fuses uh, on the right there. And uh, you can see that I've also used fuse taps, which basically connect to the uh, protected side of the fuse and they add a male spade connector there that you can then just plug a female spade connector onto. Quite a cool invention, but I've already tapped a few of these for switched power. I did discover that the top two are both um, constant power, but then I forgot that I actually have these ports here which I believe I could use as accessory power. And uh, the bottom two here are both constant. So I'm gonna test, but I believe I can get a spade connector onto that, which means I can literally just make a jumper wire that plugs onto that and plugs onto the back of the clock and we should be in business. Now, if you're unfamiliar with how to check a switched versus constant power source, uh, when you track your fuse panel down, it's a really easy way to tell. Uh, essentially, with the car off, uh, if you want to know if something is constant power, take your voltmeter, and this is just a basic one like you'd find at any uh, like auto store or anything like that, um, and you're going to want to switch it to the VDC setting and uh, the 20 amps. So right here, and basically, oh, overshot. There you go. So 20 amps VDC. And uh, essentially that means that it's gonna read up to 20 amps, so you have the right level of sensitivity and you're checking for voltage. Um, so you can also see how I have my um, little, whatever you call them, the wire thingies, probes, that's the word I'm looking for. Uh, you see how I have those connected as well. Um, so basically once you have it set up like that, you're gonna wanna take your black probe and find yourself a good ground. And essentially you just touch this to the ground and hold it there. Um, and then basically with your red probe, you're gonna to wanna to touch it to the power source. So in my case, um, essentially I checked all of the different um, fuses that were in there until I found someone that woke up, even though, like, well, I say woke up. So my voltmeter read 12-ish volts. Um, even though the, the key and everything was off. Uh, if you're checking for switched power, it should be basically non-responsive until you switch the car to accessory, at which point it should wake up. So that's a good way to tell between a switched circuit and a constant circuit. And that's your crash course for electronics for the day. So I've already created one end of my new wire and basically plugged it in at the back of the clock here and then routed it under the dash here. And then basically I checked the length by kind of running it up to the fuse panel there and then I cut the wire to length so I know it's exactly right. Uh, and I've now stripped the end and I'm going to put my little spade connector on. Like that. Oh, don't fall off on me. There we go. And give it a squeeze. Rawr. And there we have it strong connection all right I have it connected and now we wait we're gonna see if the hands move I guess putting good vibes out to the universe I should set the time correctly and then we can see if it keeps time this is not the most friendly design having to keep this thing pulled out like this but I guess it works there we go there, okay, getting there, come on. Okay, almost. Ah. There, and that is the time right now.
Hope you guys enjoyed watching me struggle. So uh, I'm going to come back in 10 minutes or so and see if that needle moved. Kind of a long shot to be completely honest, but that's completely fair. All right, y'all, as predicted, it did not work, which is perfectly okay. Again, for the price, I kind of expected it not to. Uh, I am going to double check to make sure it is getting power before I disconnect everything. Um, but essentially, uh, for the time being, I am probably just going to unplug the main power to the clock and just add that to my to-do list for later. Um, for the time being, again, it looks way better than the blanking plate. Uh, and we'll have a future video on you know how to take one of these things apart and inspect it and see about servicing it. So. Uh, either way, I want to count that as a win, um, and I hope this was helpful for you, at least as far as the proper procedure for installing one of these. And if you buy a, one that's known to be working, following this uh, procedure should basically get you a working clock. So, um, yeah, I mean, I think basically, like I said, it's a win, it looks good, it lights up, and uh, look forward to another video in the future of how to service one of these clocks. So as always, y'all, if this was a helpful video for you, uh, please do hit that like button. And uh, if you've enjoyed some of the Bel Air content on here, please do subscribe as well. We got more content coming your way as always. And uh, yeah, I mean, every single subscriber really helps us grow the channel. So it's, uh, it's a small little click of a button for you. Uh, but honestly, for us, it is just absolutely huge every time we get a new person that cares about our content and wants to see more. So thank you for the consideration and we'll catch you on the next one.